I can't hear anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Let's have the slides. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, the most fun talk and event of this conference, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you the ACM Sigmobile Rockstar Award. I need a thing to forward the slide. <laughs> Rockstars don't care about these things. Okay. The ACM Sigmobile Rockstar Award is an award that recognizes the more recent technical contributions made in an individual's early part of career in our field, and that significantly influences our field. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I need to remove my glasses to see. <laughs> There you go. OK. And there has been a number of winners. The award was started in 2013. Since then, there have been multiple uh, magnificent winners, four of them and me. And today, we are recognizing one true rock star in our field who has done amazing work over the last almost decade or so. And before I mention his name, I want to talk a little bit about his work. Uh, he has done work that I personally feel that if I were able to do them, I would really be proud of it, and I was hoping I could do work of that level. Uh, one of the first pieces of work that I remember, uh, I remember, actually this microphone's working, is uh, work on partial packet recovery, and uh, really something that showed how you can recover parts of data from a wireless packet using some interesting techniques, uh, leveraging acts in wireless systems. Then he built this system called ArrayTrack that improves uh, indoor localization in very interesting ways, gives uh, you know, tens of centimeters of accuracy, and he's demonstrated this in very uh, good implemented systems. And then Phasar and a bunch of other things like that. Uh, and you heard uh, Marco talk about him in the morning session of the first day, and there were a lot of really great accolades that were paid to this gentleman, uh, and uh, there are a few examples. Uh, he simply rocks, groundbreaking contributions, and uh, bulletproof work, imaginative researcher, all of these things that each of us would aspire to be. And with that, I would like to introduce to you the rock star of 2018 Sigma Bowl, Kyle Jamieson. Please have a please stand. So I want to read the citation, which says it's in his recognition of outstanding early career contributions and impact in the field of wireless computer networks. And with that, I will pass the ceremonial rock star hat, truly in Indian style this year. It changes every year. <laughs> to our winner. <laughs> Can I have the ceremonial rock star clicker? Sorry? Can I have the, the ceremonial rock star clicker? <laughs> yes. The glasses are mine. I can imagine what this looks like. He can take it if he buys me another one. <laughs> OK, with that, uh, I would also like to invite Marco Gruteser, the chair of ACM Sigmobile, to formally hand over the plaque for Rockstar and a generous check, which Marco can announce. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Take this hat off, please, please. <laughs> and now we hope to hear from him and we give him the choice of keeping the hat on or removing it. I'll remove my glasses so I can see something. Over to you, Kyle. So, um, so let me just start out by saying how humbled and um, thankful I, I am to the Sigmobile community um, and how humbled I am to be standing here um, after all the other rock stars uh, who are uh, truly amazing in their own right. So today in my, in my talk, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm about to talk about. Um, so uh, today in my talk, I want to do two things. Um, 
by the end of uh, this session, and I realize I'm between uh, you and lunch. So the first thing I want to do today is I want to kind of walk you through um, actually my, my whole 18-year research career, starting from um, just before I entered the PhD program at MIT in, in grad school. And I want to tell you about all the successes, well, first of all, all the failures I had, uh, and then some of the successes. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to kind of hold up a mirror to the entire um, SIGMobile community. And if the slides were working, you would see that um, on the slides. And um, the second thing I want to do is I want to sketch um, a kind of a direction um, that I think, uh, or a couple directions, I think we ought to go in um, as a community uh, in our research. Um, and the answer there is going to be, uh, first of all, looking at computing at the edge, uh, and second of all, looking at the intersection between mobile co or, or wireless uh, networks, computer architecture, and uh, wireless systems. And so um, that's where uh, I think we're going. And so going back to the first, uh, my story of, of failure and then success in research, um, the punchline there is, is going to be um, you know, uh, on, the, on the theme of teaching and learning, and I, I think I attribute uh, the successes in, in my uh, career so far to be, um, to be instances where I've either taught or been taught new things. Um, so let's get started. So I'm going to take you back to the year 2000, 2001. Mobicom was uh, about four years old, is that about right? And uh, we were in Boston and Rome. And this is a word map of all the titles of all the Mobicom papers, right? And so, uh, so what were we into back then in, in the year 2000, 2001? OK, we were really into ad hoc uh, mobile routing. We had a little bit of scheduling thrown in there. Um, sensor was a very small part of our, our research. And so my academic, where I was circa 2000, was I, um, I got my degrees, my undergrad degrees in mathematics and, um, and computer science. And I thought math was so cool um, when I finished my, and it is, um, when I finished my degree. And, um, but then I got distracted and I, I moved on, I did a, an undergraduate research with Barbara Liskoff in her uh, programming methodology uh, group. And then I, that kind of uh, uh, tugged me towards the parallel uh, distributed operating system group with Robert Morris. Um, and you know, I was like, wow, systems, this is so cool. Um, but then this bright young uh, professor named Hari um, arrived uh, at, my, at my school, MIT. And I was like, wow, these wireless cards, these Orinoco Waveland um, cards, these are so cool. What can we do with them? So. Um, that eventually led to my first Mobicom paper in 2001. Uh, Mobicom was in uh, Rome, and uh, the name of the paper was called SPAN. And um, you think, think back to the word map I showed you, uh, mobile ad hoc routing. So, um, so SPAN was about routing over mobile ad hoc, and it was also about power saving uh, um, as well. And the idea was that you, know, you had your mobile ad hoc network, your multi-hop uh, network, and these nodes would uh, be mostly asleep, but some subset of them would form a, a power-saving backbone um, and stay awake and route packets over many hops in the world, because the world was going to be one big mobile ad hoc network back then. Um, so this is great. This is a class project I did um, uh, with uh, from the students and, and Robert Morris and, and, and Hari Balakrishnan. And um, that was great. And we got back from Rome. Um, I got back from Rome. And I learned to sail. And that was fun. But the analogy was apt. I was stuck in the doldrums. I was a grad student. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just adrift. I didn't know what to do. Um, but SPAN was great, and you know, year 2000, we had the Gupta Kumar uh, capacity result. It hot off the press. It was an exciting time, and SPAN had um, combined mathematics with um, system building and networking, so the logical thing to do um, was to take those IPACs that Victor was talking about, 
um, and build a, a span network, a, a real span network, implement the thing, because um, thus far we had only simulated it. Um, and so like, I was like, okay, great, you know, we'll make, this, make this practical, so let's, let's build it. So um, the, uh, to go into a bit more detail about what this entailed, um, the, the way these, uh, uh, the power saving mode works, as many of you know, is that it relies on very precise timing based on beacons from the access points in order to um, have everybody synchronized so that they can wake up at the same time and route packets over that um, network. And the same goes for the ad hoc power saving mode. But since um, there wasn't a business case back then for uh, building a, an ad hoc uh, multi-hop network, um, that wasn't implemented in the firmware, the hardware, of our uh, typical Wi-Fi chipsets. And so the uh, obligatory approach had to be to emulate that in software. Um, of course, there was a reason that you know, power safe mode is implemented in hardware, and that's because it requires very precise timing. And all that software layers above um, the firmware that I had to go through as a, a grad student implementing SPAN, well, um, th that resulted in unpredictable um, outcomes, and the thing basically didn't work at all. It was game over. But the kind of the silver lining in the cloud was that really um, sharpened my desire that I kind of had already, but really sh that experience of, of failing um, at implementing SPAN sharpened my desire to dig down into the lower layers of whatever I was looking at. Um, and that had influence, as you will see, um, in the coming years. So fast forward to 2005, 2006, um, and the second chapter of uh, my talk, and uh, this is how I became a bookworm. So in 2005, 2006, uh, Mobicom community was, uh, well, sensor networks had uh, arisen as the hot new thing. Um, and uh, so what were we doing as the Mobicom community? We were, we were routing packets over sensor networks in a, in a mobile ad hoc mesh, uh, basically, if you look at the titles. Um, but the platform that uh, sensor networks ran on were these Berkeley moats um, and other platforms, but that's the one I used. And... Um, the thing about these moats were they're very, very simple, very low power, low cost hardware. But the simplicity of the hardware meant that I could really access, unlike um, the, the current, current wi uh, wireless LAN chips, I could access most of the stack um, and I could innovate in most of the stack. So uh, layer two link layer was still in software. Um, and uh, the phi was in hardware, but you know, most of that stack from the link layer up was now in, um, in uh, software. So this was great. So this let me kind of think um, all across the stack, as, at, and, and that is what I call systems thinking, thinking about the platform as, as a real whole. So the problem that we chose to um, a grad student, uh, a fellow grad student of mine uh, and I chose to investigate was um, you know, inspired by uh, internet congestion, congestion in, in wireless sensor networks. And so we had this multi-hop wireless sensor network um, and we were playing with hop-by-hop -hop flow control algorithms and some rate-based rate um, flow control algorithms and we got some good results. Um, but what we were really kind of uh, after was interference, wireless interference itself. And then the question kind of became, how do we understand um, interference? And at that time, we were mainly looking at the link layer and above when we wanted to address <coughs> interference and, and building a better Mac um, protocol. And what I saw, what I was able to see as a, as a grad student with all these um, moats was the entire uh, physical layer, or at least more of the physical layer um, than I had before. And I saw this kind of playground of new ideas um, that I wasn't familiar with. So that kind of became my um, motivation. Look across the layers, um, look at the whole system, and try and understand um, interference. And that led, that led to um, my becoming a bookworm. Because I knew nothing about the 
phi layer. Okay? I had almost no relevant knowledge um, at the time. So what I would do as a grad student is I would just suspend all activities you know, for every morning, and I would head to the library, and I would just soak my um, eyes in uh, Barry Lee and Messerschmitt digital communication. Um, as uh, the book, uh, actually, the, of, of Teresa uh, Mung's uh, advisor. And, um, and I saw in that, I, I, I read this thing cover to cover, and I saw in that um, a completely different look at networks and the opportunity to fuse all that knowledge with all my knowledge that I had uh, gleaned from the Mobicom community circa 2000, 2000 2005 um, at the Mac and the Link layers. And so I became fascinated by the physical layer as well as um, the link layers. So I became a bookworm. And then that led to a kind of a, a watershed. So at that point, I stopped following ideas. Um, and I started leading myself in you know, a new direction, similar to um, what, uh, what Don and the others were talking about. Um, and what that requires, fundamentally, is um, advice I now give my grad students um, in my group at Princeton when, um, when they ask me, how do I succeed in research? And that advice is, uh, I think, the number one uh, most important thing to succeeding in research is having an open mind. And what an open mind entails is that you are going to um, be willing to start from zero and become a bookworm and you know, learn some adjacent area to your own research, um, and then that will inform your research. And I've seen you know, multiple examples of this um, over the years. And leading yourself also requires you have faith. Like, it takes a, a leap of faith right, to, to stop your productive or semi-productive uh, work you know, and, and learn that new area. Um, and it also requires a lot of humility and hard work because you, know, you have to start from zero. Um, so that's how I taught myself that adjacent area of the phi. And at that time, software-defined radio just came on the horizon. Edis had their USRP software-defined radio um, that uh, Hari at MIT was using to teach um, one of the new classes in the new uh, EECS curriculum and so I was a TA for that class, and then that kind of um, catalyzed a synergy between the teaching I was doing um, as a TA for that class and um, my research. And I realized that often, very often, when you're a better teacher in the classroom, that can lead to be better at kind of teaching yourself new concepts, because the best way of, of teaching a concept to somebody else is to um, or to yourself, rather, is to explain it to somebody else. Um, so that was the first watershed. And that led to my PhD thesis on uh, partial packet recovery. And the PhD thesis was called the soft phi interface, the idea being that the physical layer would extract confidences from the uh, signals that it received and tag every bit that it passed up to the link layer with those confidences. Um, once it does that, uh, the link layer and the network layer can extract, either extract use from high confidence parts of packets, um, or all of the functions of the link and the network layers can be informed by these confidences. And I'll give you examples of that in a second. Um, so, uh, I see we have a slide problem, the same slide problem, but the, the, uh, the point of this slide is that um, this idea had um, a pretty good impact in the community. Um, and it started with um, my fellow grad student at MIT, Maitali Vudukuru, who is now a professor at um, IIT Bombay. And uh, she and I uh, first used the SoftPhi interface to uh, improve wireless bitrate adaptation. Um, after that, we looked at exposed terminal problems, so medium access control problems. Um, and we uh, made some progress there. I'm having trouble reading these slides. Um, others, uh, others also took, um, Suman in particular, took um, uh, ideas in 
uh, approximate communication and extracting the useful parts of, of received packets um, and innovated further there. And, um, and then most recently, um, with actually current colleagues at Princeton um, and uh, Barracuda Networks, Asaf Sidon, Mike Friedman, and uh, Amy Tai, um, we are together looking at applying this kind of general concept uh, for data center storage, and that's kind of ongoing work, and uh, if you're curious about that, um, that would be like a, a lovely thing I'd love to talk to you about in the hallway. Okay. So, chapter three, don't go with the flow. Um, it's pretty generic advice, but um, I like the snapshot in time. Uh, of, so here we were, here we were with uh, Mobicom in, in uh, Istanbul 2012 and, and Miami 2013, and we were really excited about cellular and I guess kind of, no, not separately, but, um, but also we were really excited about MIMO and um, we were building new uh, communication uh, paradigms with uh, multiple antenna MIMO networks. And this was and kind of still is really cool uh, research. And uh, uh, Jia showed up, uh, Jia Shong, um, who is probably somewhere in the audience, showed up at uh, at University College London, where I had started at as a, um, I'd started as a, as a fresh faculty at uh, UCL, and Gia showed up as my first uh, PhD student, and uh, the community was focused on improving MIMO, communications. Um, but we started to uh, wonder what else can we do besides, and this is the plotting the different course part, what else can we do besides um, communications with these Wi-Fi APs that are receiving signals, right, with multiple antennas, and that starts to kind of uh, feel like a little radar system in that Wi-Fi AP that's hanging on your wall. So that was the basic idea behind a ray track, um, which is the location system that uh, uh, Jia Shang and I built. Um, the idea being that um, your mobile device uh, would like to be located, and we're going to use direct measurements, okay, to do that. Um, in contrast to the, to the mass of, of work that came before that primarily relied on, um, on uh, essentially machine learning techniques. And I'll have some more to say about that in a, in a few slides. Okay, so we're going to use direct measurements. So with those MIMO antennas, the signal impinges on those antennas. And you can, as many of you know, you can compute angle of arrival from that interaction of the transmission of the mobile on those antennas, okay? So if you have multiple APs, you can then triangulate. Um, if each of those APs feeds back uh, channel state information uh, to a central server and that gets combined. Great, so that's array track. Um, but the, uh, the kind of the insight um, of array track is that indoors multipath is really, really strong. And so what we discovered was that um, in typical motion of uh, the mobile device, um, you can imagine the mobile device transmitting and uh, at a given location, that transmission will light up certain reflectors, right, on its way to the access point as the blue reflector you see here. Whereas if the mobile device moves slightly, that motion is gonna light up typically if the motion is you know, around a half a wavelength, which is six centimeters at 2.4 gigahertz, that motion is gonna light up different reflectors um, nearby, yet the direct path will stay, um, will stay constant. So once you make that observation, you can uh, make a very simple algorithm to essentially exploit the correlation between those two transmissions and hone in on um, on location using AOA, um, and you know, subsequent works have have um, subsequent work has um, yeah, examined uh, many many different uh, permutations or, or elaborations of this. Um, so indoor location was and still is um, a really uh, a really really tight uh, active field, right? Um, and so. If you look at indoor localization like pre-array track, you know, pre-2010, um, a lot of work was uh, taking or augmenting the environment with like um, more infrastructure like ultrasound or uh, some beacons uh, and still is. Um, 
and so uh, the advantage of array track was basically that uh, we only required the Wi-Fi infrastructure that was already deployed mostly. Um, in terms of impact going forward, um, the impact was twofold. So uh, the, the first kind of impact we had was uh, locating the transmitter itself. Um, and there, um, John Jenkset, uh, who you see above, um, and I took array track and, and uh, made it uh, practical on commodity APs um, and uh, the familiar Spotify and uh, later work uh, XD track um, uh, brought in time of flight and joint time angle estimation. Um, and the other uh, notable uh, occurrence is that uh, Gia went and did an internship with Kartik um, at NEC. And Kartik was really interested um, uh, about uh, distributed antenna systems in cellular networks at the time. And so um, with Kartik, that really added um, color to Gia's work. And so um, we investigated uh, similar ideas in the context of distributed antenna systems. Um, and that became tone track with um, Kartik. So um, I guess the, the takeaway for students in the audience is uh, this is a plug for, you know, for actually going and doing an internship because, um, and, you know, and hopefully an internship that's relevant um, to your uh, thesis work because um, the, the, the great successful result for Gia was that this has really added color to and, and depth to his, um, to his thesis work. But with array track, we also saw the backscatter from objects and people. And so, um, whereas the main array track algorithm was focused on canceling out that backscatter, um, this also led to um, a lot of work by ourselves and others on localizing objects and, and, um, and uh, people and tags and RFID tags indoors based on that backscatter. Um, and that work still continues today. Okay, so. Uh, the observation I want to make with uh, array track is, you know, array track was uh, focused on direct measurement of uh, of the uh, signal of the phenomenon, right? Without any um, effort at building up a model of the world, and you look at uh, radar and other work um, that uh, came before array track, um, and that work was very much, uh, not exclusively, but very much focused on building up a model of the world and essentially using uh, machine learning techniques to match readings or observations with that model of the world. Um, and I think recently we have, in terms of localization, as a community we've um, drifted slightly away from the modeling approach um, towards the direct measurement but in that, I also see an opportunity for us as a community that I want to call out. Um, because we know that, we know from recent developments that both direct measurement and machine learning have their own advantages, and they might be you know, strongest together. So in the future, um, I see an opportunity to seek insight uh, through both. All right. Chapter five, take me back to school. So uh, fast forward to 2012, 2013, and um, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, MIMO and uh, Konstantinos Nikitopoulos, um, uh, a fellow who uh, previously worked at ETH Zurich, um, arrives at UCL and uh, he's a postdoctoral research fellow and um, he's on the, on the right here looking very happy um, posing in front of the Basilica of Constantine um, in Trier, Germany. Um, and he's happy because uh, that's uh, his namesake. And um, Constantinos was very excited about um, a maximum likelihood search algorithm uh, that helps MIMO networks called the Sphere Decoder. So I'd heard of the Sphere Decoder before when Constantinos arrived, um, but I had never understood it whatsoever. And so this was the second kind of watershed in my research, um, which is letting others teach you. So let me kind of explain how that happened. Um, so to explain the sphere decoder, so uh, we have a MIMO network. We have a number of uh, transmitters sending towards the access point. We can form a linear system. 
um, y equals hx plus noise based on these transmissions. And uh, the typical way of, of decoding MIMO transmissions is, is called this linear detector, a zero forcing or a minimum mean squared error detector. Um, and that basically uses linear operations matrix algebra um, to either invert the matrix or do something similar to inverting the matrix. And the advantage is that it offers very low complexity and uh, latency, but it makes mistakes. And mistakes lead to drop packets, and drop packets lead to suboptimal throughput. So Konstantinos' passion was the sphere decoder, an example of maximum likelihood detection. Maximum likelihood detection basically is a big search what this equation at the bottom is, is, is telling you, it's a big search over all the possible permutations of what the mobiles could have sent um, and comparing that to the received signal at the axis point. And that's the arg, uh, the arg min in the equation at the bottom. Okay, so max likelihood is this big search. The sphere decoder is, and it's, it, it's computationally expensive, Sphere decoder is this reduction of that maximum likelihood search into a tree search. And the tree, each level in the tree, represents um, a different user, user one, user two, user three. And each one of the branches in the tree represents um, one of the bits that that user sent. Okay, so a leaf in the tree means that the, um, means that that's a particular choice of bits that are sent, and that's a decode result for the MIMO system. So the maximum likelihood search boils down to finding the leaf in the tree that's best. And because it's a tree, we can apply all this branch and bound tree search uh, techniques that, um, that algorithmists have come up with to speed up the, that brute force search to a point. OK, so the work with, I did with Konstantinos, uh, the first one is Geosphere. Um, it basically reduces the number of distance calculations we have to do. So you have that received signal you see as the, uh, the triangle um, in the picture, and we're going to compare that triangle to each of the constellation points. So this is 16 qualm, so we have 16 constellation points. We're going to compare that triangle, and the, um, the uh, inside of Geosphere was to do those comparisons the hard part of doing those comparisons is actually the Euclidean distance calculation um, of the received signal to each constellation point. Okay? And the innovation of Geosphere was that instead of doing the, those Euclidean distance calculations all at once for a given tree level or a point in the tree, we would actually, um, we would actually uh, use a zigzag technique where we deferred those Euclidean distance calculations and then, um, and then uh, uh, leveraged those, uh, those search uh, results in order to um, possibly never do those calculations at all. So we basically reduced the distance calculations. Um, and so that was, uh, that was Geosphere and SIGCOM and then we had further work uh, that I won't go into in, um, in NSDI a couple years ago on uh, focusing the processing um, as well. Okay, so what this brought me to in my mind uh, today is uh, kind of my proposition for um, where we ought to go as a community. So um, this, this turns out to be really useful for massive MIMO, 5G massive MIMO, so I think it's highly topical. Um, not only that, um, you know, all this work on channel prediction that we're talking about in the conference, um, all this work on localization that we've done and continue to do, and all the massive MIMO, multi-user MIMO work, um, okay, all that work requires highly, highly compute-intensive search, okay? And under tight, tight uh, time constraints. So the time is ripe, I would say, for a shift in the way we think into, from you know, purely wireless protocols to what the, the question of what are the best computational structures to support those wireless protocols. So um, what, we, what I would propose we need to do is we need to bring in um, expertise in computer systems computer architecture and all the wireless communications and think about co-design 
similar to thinking across the stack, right? Think about co-design um, between all these areas. All right, so now new frontiers, uh, more new frontiers. So uh, here we are in, in Delhi 2018 uh, and uh, 2017, 2016, we're into localization. We've branched out to security. We've gotten a bit modest. We're look, uh, we have a big towards in our, in our titles. Um, and so what, uh, what's, uh, what's on the horizon? So um, this is work that uh, started when uh, Victor did his uh, sabbatical in London and Paris. And, um, one of the uh, really interesting questions that uh, is coming up is how, what's the best way of pushing computation to the edge of, of the network? And so this is work we did on finding um, parking spaces based on users' smartphones that are riding along on the dash, on the dashboard of, um, of cars. Um, on top of that, uh, Another really uh, cool area that I think we should pay attention to is uh, extreme mobility and wireless. So uh, Wi-Fi Goes to Town is looking at uh, delivering packets to cars driving by uh, roadside, so um, infrastructure to vehicle uh, communication. And uh, that is a kind of a co-design between the Wi-Fi link layer and the handover between APs. Um, so that's a, a sitcom paper a couple years back. And then more recently with um, Wen Jun Hu from Yale, uh, I'm looking at shifting the uh, environment, or rather shifting the uh, focus of innovation from the wireless endpoints themselves to uh, programming the environment. So we're looking at, oh, if we embed you know, an array, a big, big array of, of low-cost Wi-Fi uh, or, or uh, wireless RFID, essentially, tags in the walls of a building, could we configure those tags, configure the switches in those tags to, um, to make the building more conducive to wireless. So maybe it would reduce the interference that two networks were causing each other, or maybe it would make massive MIMO, like a massive, uh, a multi-user MIMO base station work better, okay, based on changing the wireless channel. Um, and so to get that right, you have to kind of build that substrate itself and build the control behind that. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now, but I think the, the takeaway I, I, I want to leave you with um, is that for all the successes, I attribute that to moments where I have um, taught myself something new um, or somebody has taught me something new or I've taught someone else. Um, so teaching is, uh, I, I think, a, 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 a great way forward. And that requires you check your ego at the door, um, and that can manifest itself in many ways, teaching in name for academics, but also mentoring uh, for, the, for those of us in industry, and then those future ideas. And hey, a, um, a pep talk or a, a peppy note uh, for the end. I think the Mobicom community um, has done this. You know, I'm not the only one, of course. So we as a community have done this many times. We are uniquely positioned to leverage cross-layer thinking um, to teach ourselves new areas. And uh, there are many examples of this, both in the previous rock stars in the and in the community. So I'll stop there, and um, I'll thank uh, my collaborators, uh, current and former PhD students, and the Princeton Advanced Wireless Systems Research Group. Um, hello to you all, and, uh, and thank you for this award. I'm really humbled, and thanks for listening. <laughs>